today what you can do now to change the system. Hello, Guinness Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with the distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Martin. Very important conversation, this, because as we've proved in the past, things can make a difference if we do things right. And there's an opportunity. There is an incredible opportunity this week. We want to seize it. So the emphasis is on now, what you can do now, um, because we are... We are winning. The, we are fighting the war to take back, um, uh, you know, democratic control of the financial system, which ultimately is is where all control starts and ends. Um, and by that, I mean make sure the financial system serves the people, right? And it's a it's a long drawn out, you know, World War One style meat grinder sometimes, yeah. um, quagmire, but. We, we, we keep advancing on multiple fronts and we have a big one this week, which is about a, the specific case of the Sterling First victims in Western Australia, but it's a case that is representative of everything that's wrong with the system. And if this can become a catalyst for an inquiry, if, if we can get an inquiry, that inquiry can become the catalyst for a bigger examination of the failings of the system, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And, and in a way that you're reminding the politicians who get, who get um, a lot of pressures on them from vested interests, and they're, they're the, the powerful forces on them, that the ultimate powerful force is the people, right? And it would, But the people got to focus their firepower sometimes, and that's why this week's very important. So um, well, as we talk about this, um, you know, we want people to act, but know, but know by acting you are making a difference in the system. Absolutely. And just to be very clear, the focus of attention at the moment is on ASIC and their inability to do the things that they should have been doing in terms of uh, protecting consumers and businesses from the the ravages of the financial system. But it also exposes a lot more, doesn't it, in terms of what the power plays are, um, you know, how it is that, in fact, politicians and uh, the financial system are aligned against you know, ordinary Australians. And this is a great example of shining the light on this really critical issue. No, it absolutely is. So there's a few things we can touch on, um, Martin, but I want to get to the point straight away for the for the viewers in terms of what we need people to do this week and just so people can instantly start acting on it. And then we can we can discuss the um, implications in other areas, and including some of this later stuff with the... Um, uh, with the property market in Australia and, and and those concerns, because that all relates to, you know, the reason we have a bubble in the first place is you know ASIC played a role in that and APRA etc. But anyway, just let's get let's get quite specific. So regular viewers of this show and will will be aware, but for the benefit of new viewers, in the last few months we've we've reported on this case of the Sterling First uh, collapse in Western Australia. Well, it was centred in Western Australia. It's actually its victims are broader than that. Um, uh, but this is a, this is a collapse in 2019, where about 140 elderly people, their, their retirees and pensioners, um, lost collectively 18 million dollars that they had put into this um, company. The thing is, though, they had put in the money on the basis that they were prepaying rent for the rest of their life. That's all they thought they were doing. Right? These are people who didn't want to be investors, had no intention to be investors had turned down investment um, opportunities even offered by in the you know one of one of the ladies I interviewed she worked for a company that had offered her uh, shares in the company a long-term established Australian company right and she turned those down just didn't want to be investors these were not people who got sucked in by a get rich quick scheme it wasn't that kind of it wasn't that kind of collapse it was literally oh you can downsize um, because you're elderly Put this money up front. You're paying rent for the rest of your life. That's what they thought they were doing. They put their money in what, the th- what they thought was a trust account. Instead, they were um, they were sat down for a couple of hours to sign a lot of paperwork, which they thought was 40 years worth of um, real estate tenancy agreements broken into five-year lots. That's why there was a fair amount of it. 
money, the money for the trust account they had to sign off as well. What they didn't know is that there was no trust account. It was a bank account with the name Sterling Trust on it, but that's all it was. And it was fraud. Um, and within that, they were actually putting their money into a managed investment scheme. They didn't. They had no clue about that, right? And of course, when you're dealing with elderly people, uh, well, any any kind of financial predators, Martin, um, as you know, the, the, you know they, they master the art of what they do, right? And targeting elderly people is its own kind of art. And you know they probably would have had multiple cups of tea and all this kind of stuff to to um, to, to to cajole them as they're doing this, and they hand over all their money. Um, in 2019, it collapsed. 18 million dollars gone, and those they'd pay, they'd prepaid their rent, but their landlord stopped getting got stopped getting paid. And now the landlords, two years later, it's not their fault. They want they need to be paid though. They bought these investment properties. They owe interest payments to the banks, and um, they're just as much victims. And, and and because nothing's been done, the landlords and tenants are facing off in court. And the courts so far have ruled for the landlords and these tenants are left high and dry and high and dry means elderly people who lose, who've lost everything, who cannot afford to start again, they're being evicted. And um, 16 of the 140 so far have died waiting for action in this regard. And you can imagine they died under, under you know, a lot of um, stress having to deal with this, right? A terrible thing to experience at the end of your life. Last Thursday, ABC 7.30 did a story on this, which was actually, it, it, it's, a, it's a very good story. It, it covered it well. I've spoken to some of the victims since. They thought it was a disappointing story. Now, they always, that, that is a natural feeling from them because, you know, a, a six or minute story from ABC 7.30 cannot really capture everything they've gone through and experienced in the last two years it can't do that um so that's understandable but i think if if australians saw what abc did on 7 30 any australian who saw that and any australian politician who saw it would have been quite confronted by it right because it is it did it did tell the story adequately and most importantly it mentioned um the the absolute necessity for an inquiry so we're going to put a link below so that you can actually go and watch it. Please take the six minutes or whatever to watch it. And you'll, what you'll see is the, the victims um, or a number of the victims and what they're going through. But you'll see most importantly that there's a Labor senator on there, Louise Pratt, and she is now leading the discussion in the parliament for an inquiry, right? Now, if Labor wants an inquiry, we're halfway there. It just needs the support of One Nation, the Greens and the rest of the cross benches, and we're going to get it. But... We're not the only, you know, um, influence on this story. ASIC doesn't want an inquiry. The gov this government doesn't want an inquiry, right? Because they do not want to change the structures here. They do. They they want to keep ASIC weak and ineffective as a regulator, and they want to. In my view, they want to do that so they can keep. So ASIC has no power over the banks, and the banks can do what they like. But but in order to do that. It means ASIC can't function at any level in, in an adequate way, right? So there's so between now and when Parliament uh, today is Monday, so Parliament resumes next Monday, and we're going to be pushing very hard to convince all the senators to support the calls for an inquiry, but there's going to be pushback, right? And so what we have to do is consolidate that. We have to work very hard this week to lock it in. So we're working with the victims in Western Australia and, and other places. We're putting out the call today in, a, in one of our press releases, Martin, for people to make calls. And I want to appeal on this show um, where the, the Martin North audience, the digital finance analytics walk the world audience, has been very effective in the past in the calls you make. When you pick up the phone, just make simple calls to every senator in your state. There's 12 senators in each state. Where, whatever state you're in, pick up the phone and say, I'm Joe Bloggs tell the senator to support an inquiry into Sterling first. And if we get enough of those calls this week, what it'll, it'll mean is Labor will realise, OK, well, yeah, this is what we want, but we better make sure it happens. The, 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 the Greens will realise, OK, we better prioritise that. One Nation will realise we better prioritise that. You know, Jackie Lamb and the other crossbenchers will realise we better prioritise that and then we get an inquiry, right? So 
we'll have a link below. Our party has done up a, a really good list of all the um, senators by each state with their contact details. Click on the link below straight away as soon as you finish watching this and start making those calls. Um, we have a, we'll, we'll be putting up a, a fact sheet on our uh, uh, website, just a one page fact sheet for those who, you know, want to sort of have the, the, the bare bones facts of the Sterling case. Um, and you can refer, you know, we'll have links to that and you, you can refer to that. But please make the calls because if we can lock this in and lock in an inquiry, what it means is, like I said, we can use the Sterling case as a catalyst to open up the books on a much bigger story to do with the failings of ASIC because until we do, you know, we've got to sit, the way I look at things right now, as we've said on this show many times, Martin, it's now two and a half years since the Royal Commission. As far as I'm concerned, it may as well not have happened. Because such is the such is the arrogance and the determination of this government to just lay out the red carpet for the banks as usual. And they have a neoliberal ideology that basically says we have to let the you know the um, the, the free only the free market can decide wealth creation and, and investment and what you know how the economy should work. It's, it's up to us, the government, to be their their waiters <laughs> as they choose as 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 they choose from the menu of what they want to do. Right. We as the government, we're not going to provide any direction or any or we're, we're certainly not going to tell them how to behave. Right. We just get in the way. And you take if you take that approach, that obsequious, um, you know, ass kissing approach to banks, they'll take advantage of that. And they and they, and they do and they have. And, um, you know, we, we, we end up at this point and we think, well, are we ever going to. Um, one, clean up the corruption in the financial system, and two, get the financial system back to where it should be serving the people of Australia. And and also just the basic level of justice, right? When, when there's tens of thousands of bank victims in Australia, AFCA, AFCA has a statement, Martin, on the on the, um, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority has a statement on the 730, ABC 730 website. They said on in that statement, that they have 70,000 current complaints, 70,000. What does that tell you about Australia's financial system, right? And there's an, there's, there's, unless the people demand it, there's an expectation in the politicians of, oh, well, that's, you know, I mean, I don't know what they think. Oh, that, oh that's, just, that's just the price of freedom or, or, or whatever. That's, that's just the cost of doing business in Australia, right? And there's no hope that those people will receive financial justice. That's this is intolerable. We're a country that believes supposed to believe in justice and the rule of law. We the people have to demand it, and it's through winning these these particular battles. And that's what we can do this week. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got all the links and things below, so uh, folks, uh, go make those calls. But I want to make two points, um, Robbie. The first is. Um, People need to understand how unequal the relationship between is between the financial services organisations and individuals, be they businesses or, or households, right? If it was an equal relationship with all, you know, perfect knowledge both ways, then you could let the market rip. But the fact of the matter is it's not like that, right? All of the structure, processes, systems and even the legals are tilted towards the financial services players themselves and yep. against individuals and businesses even now and just remember of course that there was an attempt earlier in this year to remove the responsible lending obligations which ASIC holds um, to basically give more free reign to the mortgage sector to be able to flog more mortgages to people right it's an unequal relationship and that means that there is a role for appropriate regulation and a role for the um, you know right balance to be put in place to make sure that people are protected. The other point I want to make is that 70,000, right? That's just the tip of the iceberg because sure. they're the ones that have gone through the system and process and have, have basically not given up, right? And I speak to many people who know that they've been uh, handled very badly, sold the wrong product, uh, frankly been taken to the cleaners, misled, all of those things. But the fact is that it's too hard to try and deal with it, right? Because the, the systems and processes that are in place at the moment you know, are very weak and you have to work really, really hard to be able to break through to get your voice heard. And I've got had so many people tell me horrendous stories of, of being taken to the cleaners. And I'll also make just another point. The most uh, interesting current 
action is also in the cryptocurrency world as well, where again, a lot of people are being intensely misled by people who should know better but are spooking there too. So ASIC needs to actually up its game and to understand that there are so many areas where people's financial wealth, future well-being are being challenged by bad behaviour, bad practice. And that's, you know, from the biggest players in town to some of the newest and smallest. This is a critical area. And look, we don't have the right processes and systems in place. It's too tilted towards the big players. And the politicians up until this point have been happy to roll over and let it happen. Well, let's talk about the ideology behind that. And it's actually shocking. So if you watch the movie Wall Street, which is from 80, 88, I think, Wall Street was made, Oliver Stone's Wall Street, Charlie Sheen and all that, a great movie. The, the theme there was insider trading. Um, we had a top regulator in Australia for many years, Graham Samuel, who came out, one of the ones who came from out of the Macquarie Bank stable. In the, back in the 80s, he had caused a scandal by advocating that insider trading should be legal. <laughs> and But his, his logic, his rationale is what's most interesting because his logic was it's the law of the jungle. And if the rich, powerful players were able to legally use insider trading, all, all, all they'd be doing is, is picking off the, the weak who shouldn't be there in the first place, right? That, that's actually what he said. And you can, if you, you can go and look at the ABC interview he gave at the time. It, it, it was a scandal for a while. Later on, under Howard and Costello, he's rehabilitated and, and made the head of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, a consumer, a consumer protector, <laughs> right? Graham Samuel. Now you've got a financial, uh, the, the Financial Regulation Oversight Authority, I think it's called, this new body that was one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission. That's been set up and it's, it's supposed to overlook the regulators. And... Uh, its first job is to do a bit of an inquiry or, or, or oversight of ASIC. Who has been appointed head of that? Um, his name is Nicholas Moore. He is the former longtime CEO of the same Macquarie Bank, actually. And at, as, a, um, as the CEO of Macquarie Bank, Nicholas Moore was involved in all of Macquarie's. Macquarie does things right on the edge, right? Um, they, they find... There's this great quote I love from this guy in the British House of Lords, um, uh, Lord Forsyth of Drumland, who said investment bankers are extremely adept at finding a way between the wallpaper and the wall or getting in between the wallpaper and the wall. Well, Macquarie Bank sort of epitomises that in Australia. They'll find every way to tap into something to make money out of. Um, so that, that was his specialty. But his extracurricular activities were involved in promoting or, or, or even funding these sort of uh, uh, economic think tanks like the Centre for Independent Studies and the Tasman Institute here in Melbourne, which advocated this kind of law of the jungle economics, right? And he, and he's now the over, over. I mean, this is the this is the ultimate fox in the hen house type of thing, right? Um, these people they have a rationale in their mind for what they think the financial system should be like, and they think, oh, if uh, it it can only work efficiently if it is this way. Well, yeah, every every lion has said that to every lamb for all of history, right? Civilize, civilizations built up over time around institutions that came along and said, no, every citizen has rights and, and agencies and, the, and agency and the law has to protect everybody equally. Um, and the law of the jungle doesn't apply. We're, we're a system of laws, etc. But that is the idea. That's the economic ideology we're up against. And that's what we've, we've been dealing with the fruits of that in Australia for too long. Um, the current boss of ASIC, Joe Longo, go, go look at the headlines um, in the newspapers the last time he was at ASIC around in the late 90s and early 2000s when he was ahead of enforcement. All the headlines were ASIC is a toothless tiger. Right. Uh, what's her name? Um, Adele Ferguson did, did a lengthy financial review article on him in, in uh, 2000 based on that theme. ASIC has become a toothless tiger. He goes uh, he goes off to Deutsche Bank. 
but a few years after he was there, then, you know, the Greg Medcraft in 2014 admitted, look, ASIC is a paradise for white collar criminals. Well, now Joe Long goes back at, at coinciding with, with uh, Josh Frydenberg, um, pulling the rug out from under James Shipton and Daniel Crennan, who had tried to, you know, increase enforcement against the banks. Daniel Crennan said the banks should fear us. They're gone. And now this guy's back who the last time he was there turned ASIC into a toothless tiger. That's what you're dealing with. And just because the media doesn't report it, so you, I, I cited the 70,000 figure to you and you already knew there were more than that. I was shocked enough by the 70,000 figure. Just because the media doesn't report it doesn't mean that there's a huge section of Australians that have been completely left, let down by this. Now, they get away with it. As we've talked about many times in the past, Martin, that, you know, one of the problems that we as a party have been trying to address for a long time is the self-fulfilling prophecy of people giving up and saying you'll never change the system. Because if you believe that, you never will. And as someone who goes, well, before COVID anyway, goes, uh, you know, I, I communicate with, with politicians and senators, et cetera, quite regularly. What I've discovered in the time I've been doing that and getting to know the system in Canberra is it really, you know, for, for, for most of them, they're too distracted by all sorts of things, some important, some not, to pay enough attention to each issue and the people who are pushing agendas can take advantage of that, right? And so it's up to the Australian people, it's up to the public who, who know the, the right and wrong of this and want to address. We have to make sure we are the loudest voice, hmm. right? And that's why we keep coming up with these initiatives. Use your voice, let's focus it in there, and we'll, we will get these breakthroughs that can over time contribute to the change that is, is demanded. Yeah, and it's very important to understand that that's an antidote to the lobbying the lobbying and power brokers that are coming from the financial system itself, right? Yeah. They are by far some of the most powerful and expert influences in Canberra, both directly and indirectly. And you can look at it in terms of some of the donations that are made to both sides of politics, for example, but yeah. also just the pure lobbying that they do week in, week out, right? And in a way, what we have to do is we've got to counteract that. We've got to make sure that the voice of individuals and households and businesses are actually there and making the point that there is another story to be told and another reality that we need to develop for the future benefit of all Australians. That's as simple as it as I can make it, but it's a really important discussion. I had a great, I had a, 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 an experience, direct experience of that back in uh, 2018 when I was going to Parliament roughly every month um, while the Royal Commission was on. And as you know, Martin, we had been campaigning against bail-in, which had passed at the start of that year, the bail-in law, and for a Glass-Steagall separation of, of commercial banking with deposits from, every, from other financial activities, right, anything speculative. And the Royal Commission was making a case for us because you've got you know, these banks are big conglomerates of all types of financial services. And there was a lot of um, uh, you know, cross-selling going on and, and all this kind of stuff, and it was leading to a lot of that uh, those abuses and misconduct that was coming out of the Royal Commission. So we're, we're, I'm going into the parliament with uh, Dr. Wilson Sy, the former um, head of research at APRA, and we sat down with this one Labor member of parliament um, one day and he, we, you know, we're there to talk about bank separation, the need to separate the banks, and he said to us, well, the banks are here ahead of you. They've been going around the building explicitly talking about you must not separate the banks, Right. They were preemptively lobbying, and and and, and it was just me and, and Wilson Sy as the other lob as the as the counter lobbyists for them, but they knew this was this was something that we had had six, some success in educating people on. They knew it was becoming an issue, and they were preemptively lobbying the whole building. Don't you dare separate the banks, and you know, um, try as we might, we didn't get we didn't get Commissioner Hain to recommend bank separation in that final report. But the lobbying, that's what they do. They're, they're a very powerful lobbyist. Um, that, that said, they're so powerful, they overreach, and they, it's, it's transparent to the politicians. They, they know how, how blatantly they lobby. They're the ones on the receiving end. They just have to have the motivation from us to, to stand up against that, right? Um, and that's going to come, look, we're going we're to have a lot of issues on the back of this. We, there's... Uh, I mean, we can touch on this. We probably shouldn't spend too much time on it, but we can touch on this a bit. You know, this this mortgage thing in Australia is now very serious. Um, well, 
everyone's commenting around the world about the, the Australian uh, banks and how they, they put all their lending into mortgages. We've now had interest rates raised in New Zealand and three other countries around the world in the last few months. And that started to look like a trend to me. And, um, in, and that's driven by concerns about, about inflation. And the experts here are hoping that, you know, inflation is short term and it's just a spike. Well, if it's not, you know, there's going to be all sorts of consternation inside the central banks. Do we raise interest rates or, or we don't? Because if we do, in Australia, we're hanging on by a thread. Um, and, and if you have a, a situation where, um, the, you know, whether it be interest rates or other reasons that people start falling more and more into mortgage stress, and the mortgage stress figures, as you know, better than anyone might have gone through the roof. Um, they, they were at 30% uh, what back in January 2020. They're now at, they're now at uh, 42% and going up. Um, and then you start having you know defaults on the back of that and, and all those sort of things. And then people start looking at the details of their mortgage contracts with the banks and what they actually signed up to, et cetera, right? Unless we have a system that's willing to treat all that honestly and justly, you're, what we're at risk of is the, the regulators will circle the wagons to protect the banks, right? And the ordinary people, once again, get sacrificed to save the system. And the, you've got to make, we can't let that happen. And we have an opportunity here to expose the inner workings of the regulators so that it both benefits the, the victims of Sterling First and, and other existing financial victims and the many, many victims to come. Absolutely, Robbie. And uh, it's just worth reflecting on this, right? The term funding facility, which was very, very cheap money that the Reserve Bank threw across to uh, the major banks over the last uh, few months, um, ended up with, um, for example, CBA being able to um, basically buy back some of their shares and bolster their profits by several basis points because of the really cheap money. So in other words, taxpayers' money, right? Yeah effectively has gone back via the RBA to the banks to bolster their profits, right? First point. The other one that's worth thinking about is the Pandora Papers, right, which came out um, last week and revealed once again how the top end of town and, uh, you know, a lot of people who should know better are able to use the system to protect their assets and ship them off offshore and all those sorts of things. But Alan, Alan Kohler made a really interesting uh, comment and he said, do you realise that in Australia the... Um, solicitors and bankers and other people have been lobbying um, Parliament to make sure that the anti-money laundering rules and regulations that were recommended to be implemented some years ago relating to property have never been implemented. Right? And, and you know, one of the other things to think about in the context of property is AML and the amount of money that's actually you know, going through the property sector, which is pushing prices up once again. So, you know, there are so many things all connected here, right? But it comes back to that same fundamental question about the way finance works, who benefits, and uh, who is effectively the cannon fodder. And at the moment, like it or not, ordinary people, businesses, households, are the cannon fodder. No, that's exactly right. And that's why we've got to win these fights on principle. And if it doesn't apply to you, if, it, if you haven't experienced it yet, You've got to help us fight because you, you, like the rest of us, in danger, grave danger that you you will experience at some time in your lifetime, and and you know take it from me, this is a this is a product of this ideology I talked about that's that's taken over Australia and it's become accepted because both sides bought into the ideology, um, and it's become accepted. But now that the bodies are piling up, there's more people within the parliamentary system breaking breaking ranks and saying, oh, no, no, we do need to address this. Mm. And we have to turn that into a critical mass and a majority, right? Yep. By demanding people address it. Yep. Um, that, you know, we have to, we, there's got to be a paradigm shift here. Go back to a system that's actually committed to justice. The financial system will work fine, right? The banks will always make profits, but you can make them do it in a framework that is much more honest and where the, where the rights of the consumer and the public are protected um, and we're preemptively protected to the degree you have to where, where you know, financial predators wouldn't even dare look sideways at elderly victims like they have at Sterling First. Absolutely. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the point is the way it's working today is by design. This isn't just an accident. It's, just an, it doesn't happen. it's deliberate. Right. But that also means that you can have an alternative 
deliberate model, right? right? A model that's actually designed to benefit households and businesses and, you know, not ordinary Australians, not just the big end of town, right? It's an attitude that could actually translate into a completely different set of policies, which actually we know would generate more jobs, would generate uh, more equity for, you know, real Australians, take away some of the financial pressures that are in the system, um, and, you know, put the banks back in their box so that rather than actually backing the generation of money on money on money as the end game, it's actually using finance to facilitate real investment and real growth in real things. That's the alternative there. That's clearly where we have to take this. Well, no, that's right. We don't. We need the productive side of the economy growing. And if it's growing, then people who do want to make investments can say, well, I can invest in that it's in some businesses that's exposed to that industry etc because that's that's good for me and it's good for the country and the financial system can facilitate that whether as an investment or just through your bank and the bank is is lending in those areas etc and you're earning interest on on your bank you know or through a national development bank as as we're pushing hard to um establish that's what we should have right where because it's genuinely growing stuff and, and for a reason that will always be there, we need those things that are being produced and that kind of productivity. People can be confident long term. Mm. Instead, instead of these, you know, everyone thinks, oh, it's, I've got to be exposed to the property market somehow because that's the only thing that's going. And then the, the charlatans come along and have, have these schemes and, you know, they look good on paper and they're too easy to fool people into it. Or just some of these more exotic financial investments where, all you, you know, the, all they're selling you is the bottom line of a high, you know, a high rate of return, and you, you compared to your zero point one percent RBA cash rate, you know, it, it looks too good to pass up, um, and 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 you end up exposing yourself to something you can't even begin to imagine how it works, right? Because it's so exotic and complicated, etc. And that's what they've, that's what they, how they they're, they're sacrificing, um, all 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 the the public to financial predators, right? Mm-hmm. So no, the system will work fine if we can reform it. But the the oversight part is very important. So these regulators are very important. So yeah, look, um, uh, we have had a lot of success in getting these inquiries up. Um, and then once the inquiry is up and we you pay attention to what happens in the hearings, all sorts of things can come out in the back of that. We, we could have potentially very powerful hearings around the Sterling first case and the failings of ASIC. I know there are senators very motivated to prosecute the case, right? And in an ex- in extended hearings, that can be powerful, absolutely powerful. I mean, you know, we're the party that got the inquiry going into the, what happened to Christine Holgate, right? And remember the hearings into that. If people, you know, they were incredibly powerful that exposed the privatization agenda, etc. Um, we ha- we can do that with this. But this is a, even a bigger issue because it, it has far it, its consequences not just to Australia Post; it's far-reaching consequences to the to the uh, economy. So, with that in mind, and with the with the confidence that we can that you can make a difference this week, hit the phones, make those calls, get onto as many senators as you can in your state, say your bit, right? Keep it simple. You know, I'm Joe Bloggs. Tell the senator to support an inquiry into ASIC and Sterling first, and let's make it happen this week. We can get it locked in next week. I'll give you an update, um, uh, you know, as, as when I know uh, how things are travelling. But we, if we can get it locked in next week in Parliament, the following week is Senate estimates. The senators can already start asking, you know, ASIC and other agencies the right questions there. But then you can have proper hearings, and this can really become a big problem for the government um, ahead of the next election, right? So. Gird your loins, <laughs> go back into battle, and <laughs> um, let's make it happen this week. Yeah, Robbie, thanks for your time. And uh, folks, you've heard it, you know, very important conversation, this very important opportunity to, again, influence the shape of future policy in Australia. Pick up the phones, read the links below, and get going. Thanks, Robbie. Yeah. Thanks, Martin. See ya.